Today we're starting the Ma'amal Sheni, the second Ma'amal of the Kuzari. And the Ma'amal Sheni also, the same way the Ma'amal Sheni started with the story regarding the king and the friend. So the Ma'amal Sheni starts with the story regarding the king. But not necessarily as a friend, and let's read. After these conversations of Ma'amal Rishon, so then, after all these, all these stories that happened in the book of Divrei, I mean, the Kuzarim had started. The king basically went to his uh, advisor, his main advisor, and told him, told him about the dream. And the dream what happened, he was told he should go to the matter uh, somewhere and in Varsan, probably the area of uh, where is this area today. And over there you will find what? The good actions, the good deeds in the eyes of God. So both of them went together. The king and the, uh, the king and the uh, king. And, uh, and his help, and his vizier, and his helper, they went to the mountains in the what is midbar in the desert above the sea. Where you can see, where you find, where you can find a desert above the sea. They found what a cave. Where Jews actually went to, went to be in the care for Shabbos. To these people, they talked with them. And over there, they basically did a Brit Milah, and they became Jews. They don't have a mikveh over here, but let's say they had a mikveh. What? What did you say? Okay. They came back to the land and their heart was completed in the faith and of the religion of Israel. They would actually hide their faith, their belief. Until they found a way to tell the secret, slowly, to a small amount of people. And when they had basically a lot of people already were believers, so then they advocated their faith. And when there was a majority in their nation, they basically took and made all the Kuzarim part of the, of, of the religion of Israel. We'll speak about it. You're right. It's a wonderful question why they hide. And then they called a lot of rabbis, a lot of scholars, a lot of nations, a lot of kings. And they came with books. And the Kuzarim learned Torah from them. And after that, their, their nation basically had a blast, had a boom, and, basically, and they conquered a lot of land on the entire Europe. And they had hundreds of thousands of soldiers, a lot of money. Together with that, they loved the Torah. And basically, they glorified, they mystified Yerushalayim, the city of the Mikdash. Until they built over there the Mishkan, a model of the Mishkan that Moshe did. And basically, they really respected the sons of Israel, the Israel, they lived among them. And all of them basically were told. And now we're going back to the king. Stopping the story, going back to the king. He made the friend, he, listen, the king is already what? Is already Jewish. After he became Jewish, and he came to learn what happened, he took his chaver to be his rabbi. Would ask him questions on the Shona Ivrit, on the language. Let's stop over here for a second. You know what? The first questions were basically on the Tarim, on the way we describe God. 
שלפי הנראה יש פחדים מהם מן ההגשמה, מן האלוה. אז זה אם some of them have what? הגשמה? some of them have like basically making God human. אם כי השכל דוחה את ההגשמה, אבל זה מיין וג'ק זה ההגשמה. והתורה לא הוכיחה אותה במפורש. There's an obvious question over here. The king became what? Jewish, right? Uh, it's not a question. It's not something to do before you become Jewish? To learn the Torah? The king is going through a huge change. As a king, his actions what do? Do? Matter. And since so his actions do matter, what happens over here? He becomes Jewish and hides it. It's not a simple action. He's bounded by politics. He hides it. We'll, sp we'll speak about it afterwards. He's, uh, he's bounded by politics. But what? What happens over here? We figure out that the king didn't actually understand to what he's going into. Every person opens a Torah, what happens to him? What happens to him? He sees that all the Talim of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That is a question to ask before you become Jewish, not after. What happens over here? What? It's not that it does it the opposite way. Let's try and think about it for a second. The king knows who? Personally. Who he knows personally. Who he feels that he knows personally. Who he feels he knows personally. God. Right? Prophecy, right? He had prophecy? He had a dream? What the Chavir did for the king? What the Chavir convinced the king? He convinced the king that Am Yisrael is special. He convinced the king that the Torah, that the actions do matter. He convinced the king that you need to connect spirituality to actions. Wonderful. He convinced the king basically in Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Torah Yisrael. Never spoke about what? About? God, right? They never actually, in my Marishan, had a conversation on God. Now remember, what is the base that the king actually becomes Jewish? By what? By knowing the Torah. By accepting the fact that there is such a concept as called Torah. What is not the base that the king becomes Jewish? the faith in God. Because according to the king's perspective, what he has to say, that basically, God is God is God. Doesn't matter where he is, which nation has a God, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what is the perspective, God is God is God. But then what happens? The king actually opens a book. When the king opens a book, what he figures out? That it's not so simple. He figures out that in the Jewish religion, God has what? At least he has tarim. The Torah describes him as almost as a human being he's angry he's happy and he doesn't understand he says that's against the mind that's against the sechel what is the base according to that to the jewish religion to am israel to Eretz israel to Eretz israel is the base is knowing god according to that no what is the base knowing what the torah the nation the land. God is not the base. And you know what? It makes a lot of sense after we said what we said. Because God is a international concept. Almost everyone in the world believes in God. Or let's put it this way, almost all, all of the religions believe in God. The big religions believe in God. The concept of there is a God, that is not what? That is not a question that actually the king is asking. Because for him, the fact that there is a God is what is? Obvious. It will be a mistake to call the Kuzari a book of emunah, a book of faith. Because it's not. 
Kuzari doesn't deal with the subject of if to believe or not to believe in the existence of God. According to the Kuzari, this question is not relevant. According to Kuzari, it's, it's obvious that there is a God. That's not the question the Kuzari targets. That's the question the Chaver targets also. What is the problem over here? When the king actually stops to read the book, he sees that the way the Torah describes God is totally against the way he understands what is God. And then he asks the question. You see what I say? Now you're asking regarding why the king has to hide. To keep this question, and we'll, go, and, and we'll get back to it. I'm not sure if today, if next, if next week, but we'll definitely will speak about it. Another motive that is really interesting is that the king goes to where? Goes to a cave, right? He goes to a cave, and in the cave he finds Jews, and the Jews worship Shabbat. <laughs> there were no Jews that worshipped Shabbat except the caves. What's the story of going to the cave? What is this desert story? Why do they need to hide when they do Shabbat? So you say maybe it was in a bad time period. Maybe it was a time period that you couldn't, couldn't actually fulfill the command of Shabbat because it was against the law. That's basically what you imply. Maybe. Maybe not. Where is this cave? The cave is, is in his land. We don't know. But there's a good chance that the answer is what? Yes. Maybe we can start and learn a little bit more about what? About which type of, of land, of kingdom, was the Kusarim kingdom? It was a kingdom where Jews actually had to go to the cave to do, to learn, to keep Shabbat. What is the problem with Shabbat? You tell me, what is the problem with Shabbat? What will be the problem of a person in Mamlechet Kuzarim with Shabbat? Work, what do you mean work? Taking a day off. Taking a day off. Who said taking a day off is legitimate? It's a joke. You know that in the books, and from the Roman time, so they basically, a lot of the claims that the semical claims against Jews were what? That they're resting on Shabbat. That they even have a day on Shabbat. They say it, Jews are so lazy because they have a day off. Today, what looks so natural and so simple and so logic wasn't so simple. But let's say that we are talking about a nation that works seven days. We do speak about a nation that their base is so strong that Jews actually had to hide. You understand how big was the move of the king? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see about it soon. Not, I'm not sure that today, I'm just only pointing out points. And now, after we said that, we can go to the answer of the Chaver regarding the way people describe God, regarding Torah Tatearim. That's basically what we have over here. And you will see that the Te'arim are really close to the way that, that to the Rambam's approach. What is the famous Rambam's approach regarding the Te'arim, you know? And when we say God, God uh, Hashem is Chacham, it means what? Sheulot Tipesh, that he's not stupid. Or it means Sheulot Lo Chacham, that he's not not smart. But it doesn't mean that God itself is smart. Or when we say God is angry, it doesn't mean that God is angry. I assume that you heard about it already, right? I assume that you're familiar with that, right? Okay, after we said that, let's go inside and then, and then, we'll, then we'll need to ask the obvious question. They're basically stories and ways to describe God. All the, all the names of God are basically stories. They tell a narrative, or they describe. 
התפעלויות שהנבראים נפעלים מגזרותיו ומעושיו. All of them are what? All of them are שאולים. What are שאולים? Are taken basically, are being, uh, are being uh, implied from the actions that the human beings do. And basically, because we are angry, so we say God is angry. Because we do things, so we say God also does things. That's because that's our only way we can actually understand and, and recognize and, uh, and realize what it means to have a God. Or what it means to say God has actions. כך הוא נקרא החום, כאשר היטיב לאדם אשר קודם לכן היו אנשים מרחמים עליו בצר לו, מייחסים לנו לאלו רחמים וחמלה. That's a way when a human being um, that was miserable, something, hap- uh, something that is happy happens to him, he calls him בחום, he says that he is merciful. אם כי לפי מהותם בנו, אין אלה כי אם חולשת הנפש היא פעלות טבענו, דבר שלא ייתכן בו יתברך. But The merciful, the mercy is what? It's something that is inside of who? Inside of us. Something that's not connected at all to God. ZANG-EN-MOZIEK <laughs> היו שמחים כשהם זוכים בדין, אבל עצובים כשהם יוצאים בדין. ככה אלוה המכונה אצלנו לפי בחינת פעולותיו, פעמים בשם אל חנון ורחום, פעמים בשם אל קנון נוקם, אם כי הוא יתברך אינו משתלם מתואר לתואר. בעצם, כשאנחנו אומרים שאלוה הוא מרסף, כשאנחנו אומרים שאלוה עשה צדקה, כשאנחנו אומרים שאלוה עשה צדקה, הוא עשה צדקה, הוא עשה צדקה, הוא עשה צדקה, בעצם, כל הדברים האלה הם הדברים שאנחנו רואים את הרעיון. לא על ידי מה? It's not really the core of God. That's not really what God is. Till here's the words I'm saying are simple. Yeah, so, so we can understand him. But it's not really him. Till here, that's basically, that's a classical approach, the way to describe when, the, the, way, the way we approach when the Torah actually describes God. It's not only a Jewish approach, it's also a Christian approach, it's also a Muslim approach. That's basically the way we explain these stuff. I'm not so sure it's a Christian approach, but definitely a Muslim approach. It's a philosophical approach also. It's a Kuzari over here, Rabbi Yehuda Levi seems that he's going in the same path. Then he goes on, basically, and speaks about, if you will see, look inside, מורי שום העשיר, משפיל אף מרומם, חנון ורחום, וקנו ונוקם, וגיבור ושדאי, ברוך הוא מבורך, מהולל וקדוש, ורם ונישא. And it says these are only things people praise God. And also the stuff that people say, to say God is not like this. For example, חי, ואחד, וראשון ואחרון. לא תואר בהם האלוה, כי למען ישולה ממנו אפחם. לא כדי יחסם לו באורתם השכיחה אצלנו, כי אנחנו איננו רואים חיים, כי במקום שיש בו תחושה או תנועה, ולא המרומה מעל אלה. אם אנו מתארים אותו בתור החי, אינו מכנים בזה, כי אם ישוב מנתחו את הגופים, הדומים או המתים. כי אכן לפי הסברה הראשונה של האדם, כל שאינו חי הוא מת, ולמסך אינו מחייב סברה זו. כך למשל, לא נייחס הזמן את החיים. לא מפני שהזמן מת, כי מפני שאין החיים והמוות נכנסים בגדרו. Basically he says, when we say HaKadosh Baruch Hu is alive, it's not that we mean that he's not alive. It's to say HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not dead. Because for us, everything that is not alive, it's basically not dead. But then he goes on and gives something, and says something interesting. What he says, he says, look, to be honest, according to our mind, according to our intellect, it's not true to say that everything that is not dead should be, we should call him what? Alive. For example, let's take time, for example. Can you say regarding time that time is dead or alive? The words dead or alive will not be a way to do what? To explain time. So now I want to stop for a second. So why are these words are words to explain God? And over here, that's a hint. It is a way that, that's... That's a hint of the fact, that's the way the Rabbi Yudah Levi explains the system, the shita of Tarim is not exactly, doesn't exactly, is not the same like the philosophers explain or even like the Rambam explains. 
and I'll prove my point. When Rabbi Yudah Levi says that if you want to be honest, we can't really say that when we call a Kadosh Baruch Chai, it means that he is not dead, because we don't need to call every, we can't, we don't say this table is alive, right? We don't say this table is dead, right? We don't use the word living or dying regarding any object. So therefore, why we can't say also a Kadosh Baruch Hu is like, uh, a Kadosh Baruch Hu is not alive or dead. What to say a Kadosh Baruch Hu is alive. And over here you do start and see the point. To be honest, this entire system of Talim Shirim it will be really complicated to Rabbi Yehuda Levi. Will it will be really complicated to Rabbi Yehuda Levi. What is the focus? What is the fixed point? What is the highest level of the human being regarding Rabbi Yehuda Levi? Remember when we spoke about it? It's pra, it's prophecy, right? It's when a human being has the merit, has the schut, to actually speak with him. Prophecy. This entire concept of prophecy is against, goes in some way against the concept of Talim Shalim, and I'll say it even more. What is the most important moment in the history of the world, according to Rabbi Dayan Levi? History of Am Yisrael, according to Rabbi Dayan Levi, is what is Ma'amad Hal Sinai, right? Where everyone, the entire nation became God to the prophecy. If that Ma'amad Hal Sinai, we could say, is the moment where Kadosh Baruch Hu actually told Avraham, Lech Lecha Matzecha Mecha Bet Or is or the moment that Moshe took, took Am Yisrael out of Egypt. These are moments of what, where Kadosh Baruch Hu does, what does? Reveal himself. Tom Israel does reveal himself to Moshe Rabbeinu. Does reveal himself to Avraham Avinu. This concept of Idgalut is not what? Is not a concept of not describing God. Because when a Kalashbuch reveals himself to you, what happens? You hear a voice. You can say it's not a natural voice, it's not a normal voice, but it's still what? It's still a voice. When you see a Kadosh Baruch Hu, when you have prophecy, you see a Kadosh Baruch Hu in your, in your mind. And your mind basically describes your own pictures. When Ishayahu sees something, he sees it so vivid because his mind, that's the way his mind translated what he, what he heard, what the prophecy he got. If the center is the connection between the human being to the God, and between the God to the human being, even more important than that, if the center of everything is a connection between God and human being, what actually happens over here? We can start and understand a little bit more why we have so many te'arim. Why we have so many what? Why we have so many ways to describe God. In the word of idol, uh, of, of idol worshipping, what basically happens? What is an idol? There are two options to say what it's a, what's an idol. An idol is something that you built, and it's a symbol to God, right? And then there's no, like, it would be ridiculous to speak on the connection between an idol to a human being, right? No, so the idol worshippers know that. Or the second thing to say no is the idol is really, 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 really God. And then they will need to answer to themselves what? Why nothing happens with the statue? And they are and they give answers. Second option is basically to say, no, God is basically like the Greek said. The gods walking among us. Gods are like human beings, Mamash. And since God are like human beings, Mamash, they have characters. And we can't describe them in human character characteristics. And that's scary. What the, Kuzari said, what the Kuzari does, he does something really interesting. He says, it's not that God has characters. It's that we have characters. We think in models. We look on things. It says we think in models. It says we look on things. So yes, we describe God in our own way because that's the only way we actually have a connection to him. The connection to God, the, 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 God the, the fact that God reveals Himself, that is the center of our religion. And since that is the center of our religion, so we, the way we understand, the, the way we understand the Galut, 
is only by kelim inoshim, is only by, by, by human system. But it's not, God, it's not God revealing His own characters. It's us translating God to our own words, to our own characters. It's us translating a meaning that is so big to be actually translated. So we try and we do translate. That is, according to the Kuzali, that is the meaning of all the tarim that we see in the Tanakh. That's the reason why we call it Kadosh Baruch Chai. Because he's not dead. Because in some way, meeting a Kadosh Baruch is like meeting someone. It's a meeting. You don't meet a table. You meet something. So something can be alive. Or not, not, or not dead. We are over here, the Torah is trying to do something that is really unique. The entire noise, the entire system, the entire way, the entire music of the Tanakh, not only the Torah, the Tanakh is what? The entire music is God revealing Himself. That is the center. It's God revealing Himself to the Prophets. It's God revealing Himself to Moshe Rabbeinu. It's God revealing Himself to everyone. And if the entire music is God revealing Himself, so obviously the Tanakh will be felt with what? Will be full with the way humans describe God reveals Himself. But that doesn't mean that that is really God. That's the way the humans describe what they felt when God revealed Himself to them. This entire concept of God revealing Himself is hard as it is. How the end Sof can reveal himself to the Sof? Maybe that is the reason every time we have prophecy in the Tanakh, what happens? Either people fall asleep or people are extremely scared. And God in some way helps them, right? For example, but he's saying, Why is he saying, Why is the wind took me? The wind took me because I fell. Why I fell? Because I fell because I was so scared from the voice of God. That is the meaning behind it. That's the meaning over here. The meaning between the end self, between God, the endless to the, to, uh, to, to the creature that has ending is so big, it's so swiping, so obviously God in some way supports this meeting. If God wouldn't support the meeting, the meeting would, would never happen. What happened to Amisa when they met God in Hal Sinai? They were scared, they wanted to die because it can't work together. The reason only Moshe could have. The words that we describe God, the words that we describe God, a human's way to describe what? Not God itself to describe the meeting. The meeting of God. The fact that human beings can meet God. What happens in the meeting? What the feelings I felt when I actually met God? So I felt he's alive. It doesn't mean that he is alive, no. But I felt that he's alive. I felt like this. I felt like that. In some ways, the Tanakh is the biggest subjective creation ever. You see what I say? Because it's a subjective creation for a human perspective. It's even more wonderful. It's God putting himself in human shoes and writing how a human being would have feel when he meets him. Will feel when he meets him. And that is the secret of the Talim according to the Kuzali. Next week we'll go on and explain more and more and more of this concept.